My name's Stephen Ahoy. I'm a local Inuwin man from the Armadale area. Inuwin is our local clan, but our nation is Nanawana, which stretches basically from Glen Ennis to Walker. And this is the country that we are on today. I'm Ewan Belson. I'm lucky enough to be running the Birds of Prey project on the Northern Tablelands and I work at Local Land Services in Armidale and we're building quite a team here amongst the university and also working with Southern New England Land Care. My area that I'm specialising are basically woodland birds and I'm very lucky that Birds of Prey sit right at the top of the food chain there. My observations of, of our landholders over the five, six years that I've been working with local land services is that they do value enormously their environment, but sometimes they'd like to find out a lot more about it. And a very attractive way of finding more out about their remnant vegetation and about why they should perhaps plant some trees in a few areas is the birds, is those areas off chock-a-block with birds we need to take care of them. And the birds of prey, of course, are ones of particular interest because they're such high profile. At the moment, we're in Imboda Nature Reserve and we have a square tail kite just up there and both parents are, are there and they've got eggs at the moment. So it's a great spot to be and, and in Boda, like a lot of other patches of rich woodland like this, do support our threatened species and other species of birds of prey as well as a range of other species. I'm Stephen Davis and I'm an adjunct in zoology at the University of New England, but my job is on the local land services bird of prey monitoring project. I'm under contract to find nests of our threatened species, which are the three target species are the little eagle, white-bellied sea eagle and square tail kite. And we may get lucky and find spotted harriers and black falcons further out. The idea of monitoring the nests is to find out how many are successful and how many young they have each year, so we get an indication of how many young birds are entering the population each year. And we're looking at factors that might affect breeding success as well, and what determines whether they get young ones off or not. The environment is so far providing what they need in terms of nest sites and food foraging habitat, so they're still around, but we know they've declined over time. The, the three target species, yeah, they're all listed, so it reflects the fact that they have declined. But, but so far, the environment is providing what they need. So our three target species, uh, between them, eat a number of agricultural pests. So little eagles particularly like to eat rabbits, and the sea eagles uh, take a lot of carp. And the kites are more specialised on the native uh, woodland. They can catch things in woodland, although they occasionally take a rabbit kitten or a, a small rodent or something. But, but yeah, the, the two eagle species particularly uh, do target pest species. Each territory on a property is important in terms of the overall population level of these birds because they're fairly sparse, fairly thin on the ground. So because they're declining, each territory is important and it's great that landowners, if they have sort of ownership of a territory, that they're helping to protect these birds and maintain the population. If people are having trouble identifying birds of prey, they can send us photos or video. It doesn't have to be high quality. It's possible to identify them that way. It helps to have several angles, either in photos or video.
sit outside here. My name's Professor Paul McDonald. I'm the head of the Animal Behaviour and Ecology Lab here at the University of New England. And we research animals in a number of different ways, looking at their ecology and how they operate within their environment, right down to their behaviour. So that's really trying to understand why animals do what they do and what the benefits and costs of those behaviours are. So our research is, is really quite broad in terms of the number of different projects that we have running. One of the areas which we're really passionate about is this Birds of Prey project. So the core aim of this project is to understand how the populations of the birds in the region are tracking. And by that I mean whether they're going up or down or stable. These birds are of conservation concern, so if we don't do anything, their populations will continue to decline. So we're interested in monitoring that and seeing how well they're performing and understanding the pressures that might be impacting their productivity. So whether that's loss of nest trees or climate change, for example, prey availability, there's a whole range of things that might be underway. So by understanding what's happening at each nest, we can get an idea of how that whole population is tracking and then inform landowners and land managers about the types of things that might be available to turn that around. We're working really closely with local land services, land care groups, a range of different government organisations, whether it's national parks and so on, but really a lot of the project, it's interactions with landholders and you know, the actual property owners that have these birds on nesting or, or using their areas that they're looking after, and really that interaction with land managers is, is one of the joys of the job in terms of seeing that close links to community and, and how we can better integrate these birds with the people around them. What we're looking for here in, in landowners in terms of you know, that skills is really an attention to detail and, and understanding or just noticing what's happening in their environment. So it might just be noticing a bird carrying a stick in the environment or something like that and that's a good clue that maybe there's some nesting underway or, or something's happening so, which we can uh, then follow up. Landholders are absolutely crucial to this project and we can't be everywhere at once so the more eyes that we have out and about reporting this information back the more data we have and the more certainty we have then in, in terms of understanding how these birds are going and the real pinch points that might be impacting the population. So landholder engagement and general public engagement more broadly is absolutely key to this. Photography is a, a great hobby of mine. I've been fortunate enough to travel to quite a number of places around the world and, and just really wanted to take photos of that as we went and it's something that's grown from that and it's a real pleasure to be able to capture these birds up close and that's that's why I do it, I love it. Little eagles usually seen in flight and sometimes on roadside trees or poles or posts or feeding on roadkill. To identify it, it's slightly bigger than a crow or raven. It's quite compact. It's brown and white with a distinct underwing pattern in the light coloured form. Well, mostly brown in the darker coloured form. It has large feathered legs, which you can see when it's perched and at reasonably close range. It has fairly flat wings when it's gliding or soaring. It lives in open forest and woodland and adjacent grassland and pasture, and it nests within patches of mature forest or woodland, and it has a nest of sticks similar to a crow or a raven, and they often put the nest in a mistletoe. It's quite vocal, often gives an excited two or three note whistle and often from so high up in the air that you mightn't see the bird at first, you might have to look for it in order to locate the source of the whistling call. If we move on to the square tail kite, it's rarer, so you won't see as many. It's usually seen in slow circling or gliding flight low over the tree canopy of woodland. In appearance, it's like a stretched little eagle with very long wings and a long tail. It's mostly brown with a white cap and a distinct underwing pattern. It's a bit rusty on the underside, rusty brown sort of colour. And it has quite small feet, so you won't really see its feet when it's perched. And it has distinctly upswept wings when it's gliding. It lives in open forest and woodland and it, it nests within mature patches of forest of woodland and, and the nest is a platform of sticks, which is often flatter and wider than a little eagle's nest. 
It usually searches the tree canopy intently in flight from just over and among the tree crowns. And if we move on to the sea eagle, the white-bellied sea eagle, it's a large eagle that's readily seen and heard often in flight and it's often near large water bodies like rivers, lakes, dams and reservoirs. It's the size of a wedge-tailed eagle. It's grey and white. It looks a bit more compact. But the young eagles are brown, like a wedge-tailed eagle almost, but they have a shorter white tail and they have bare instead of feathered legs and they have a distinctive loud goose-like sort of honking and cackling call. Yeah, they live near large water bodies, but they nest in mature forest or woodland within one or two kilometres of water, and they build a huge stick nest in a large tree. And they often soar and glide over the water and they make a shallow dive at, at fish on the surface. And they often perch prominently overlooking water when the white head and breast can be quite obvious. If we consider spotted harrier, it's less likely to be seen on the tablelands and even less likely to be found nesting here, but they may nest further out to the north, in the northwest of the region. It's usually seen floating low over the tops of tall grassland, pasture or crops, sometimes perched on fence posts. It's similar to the little eagle and square tail kite in size. It's, it's, it's rather lanky, long wings, tail and legs, but it's blue-grey on top and rusty underneath with white spots has quite an owl-like face, a sort of facial ruff or facial discs like an owl, has a thickly banded tail, long yellow legs and it glides on upswept wings and its nest is a platform of sticks in a leafy tree in open forest, in open woodland or a paddock tree. It's typically seen gliding low over the tops of tall grass or crops with wings held in a distinct shallow V and the long legs sometimes dangled. My name is Matt Makem. I'm a ranger with the National Parks and Wildlife Service. We're at Apsley Falls, which is part of Oxley Wild Rivers. At the moment, we're on top of the gorge, and the gorge country is recognised as part of Dungadi country. From the First Nations perspective, they've been coming here for thousands of years, and there's quite a lot of evidence of that around the site. And it is quite special. It is an amazing site. So raptors are very important when, when you look at their role in the environment and the food web. They are that apex predator at the top of the food chain. They are uh, the canary in the coal mine in some ways where if, if they drop off in numbers and breeding then there's, there's a problem below. Further in the food chain and that can be an indicator of something else that's, whether it's man-made or, or not, that needs looking at. Well, we are part of the Birds of Prey Monitoring Program as a significant landholder in the region. It's good to see a project where the information is put out to community so people know what to do when they find animals on their, their property especially raptors that they don't see very regularly. It's good to be part of that monitoring process and that's what parks do as a, a conservation agency. Once you start finding out what makes birds special, start looking at the next bird and you're thinking, well, what makes these guys so special? How can they live with this bird? What makes, so, makes you such a great survivor? And, those parts of birding develop over years and it just evolves. And I think the good thing about birding is you can pick up a pair of binoculars and you can go anywhere in the world. Bird watching, we went bird watching on our honeymoon over in Africa, it was, it was great. <laughs> it um, costs you nothing and provides hours of entertainment. Each bird's quite amazing uh, and I think that's what gets you hooked.
told us oh. that we My name's Anne Starr and I live just to the north of the Little Angoslan Lagoon and just to the east of the, the Ben Lomond Lagoon. So it's a pretty special part of the world to live in and I'm yeah very lucky to, to be here. My family has been here on Foxforth uh, for almost 70 years and uh, the Star family's been in the Gyra district since uh, about 18, in the 1850s. So we're well and truly entrenched. I've had a pair of white-bellied sea eagles nesting. Feel like, I guess, I'm a bit of a custodian of the eagles and uh, they've, they've chosen to nest here in the past, which is, yeah, it's a pretty special thing to be part of for sure, yeah. I've been fortunate to have a lot of advice from Steve Davis. You know, just it's really interesting learning about their their breeding habits and nesting. It's, it's just been really interesting to, to take an, I guess, an active interest. Being part of the project, I've found, is, is really valuable. And I guess for other landholders who are a bit uncertain about what it involves, I've had people say to me, oh, don't you have bird watchers and scientists and ecologists, you know, traipsing about all over the paddocks? And the answer is no. I do a lot of the monitoring and provide feedback to the project. So anyone who does have a bird of prey of interest nesting on their property, don't be afraid to come forward and, and get involved in the project. We've got a 1,200 hectare property here with uh, beef cattle, uh, grass fattening and backgrounding. We've been keeping an eye out on the sea eagles for about oh, probably three or four years now and I think it was about three years ago we had a, a, a um, successful nesting. Yeah, I suppose one of the things I have learned about them that's very obvious is uh, listening for their call and that was how I actually picked up where they were nesting. I think the fact that we know they're there, we don't necessarily you know go past there deliberately all the time we just go around past the nest site particularly when we know there's young in the nest we sort of going to go around past there sort of when we have to and try and keep 100 to 200 meters away and with binoculars you can get a good view of them yeah i think it's important that with eagles or any raptors that are an apex predator within the ecosystem the environment that if we can enhance in some way or at least have a better understanding of where they're nesting, what their populations are, and then people who understand them far better than I do may be able to um, come up with strategies to increase or at least maintain their populations um, because they are an important part of the system. I'm Chris Baker, the bird coordinator for the Northern Tablelands Wildlife Carers and the, the raptor coordinator as well. We're just about to go in and apply some ointment to the eye of a barn owl that's been in captivity for a month or two. It was caught on barbed wire and lost most of the feathers or all the flight feathers on one wing. It's had an uh, intermittent eye problem that we've solved now. It just that needs five days of ointment and anti-inflammatories to bring the eye back. If, if the eye goes, the, it's not usable. That means its survival rate drops remarkably. Alongside keeping birds and rehabbing them for Northern Tablelands wildlife carers, I breed a lot of my own birds. I've had birds since I was a kid grew up with birds. A lot of people don't like the idea of captive birds, but you learn so much about birds in general and their behaviour and, and their nature. It's a bit of an investment in time and trouble and money. It's a lot of it my own money, but uh, it's what you contribute to the, the birds that you want to look after. This uh, aviary here is 20 metres by 10 by 4 metres high, just adequate for larger birds. We've got three wedge tails in at the moment, but uh, with the netting, the nylon netting's forgiving with the shade cloth on. So if a bird hits the wire, they're not going to do any major damage to their feathers or, or injure themselves. It was a three month project to put it up paid for by a concert that I organised for the group and uh, grants from National Wildlife Council um, helped to finish it. So 
so um, it, it adds uh, it's a big help for me to ha have something like this here that um, other groups don't have I think this is probably the only one fly to every north of Sydney um, in this area, anyway, on the inland anyway, so we're lucky to have it here. Two major uh, injuries would be car strike or barbed wire, injury on barbed wire. Um, that's quite a common one. Um, the, um, they tend to be rescued a bit more successfully because it's usually um, well, they, they can restrain to start with usually, and um, uh, whereas it, being hit by a car, they can crawl off onto the side of the road and be lost, you know, in the grass, and people don't see them till they, they just die. But um, wedge tails particularly get hit by cars, so they've, they've eaten a lot, and they can't get off the ground quickly, and so they um, they, they just can't get above the car quick enough. And I think people underestimate just how heavy they are especially when they're fed up with a huge amount of food. So. Caring for raptors particularly is a very different setup to a lot of wildlife care in the fact that it involves a lot of killing of other things. It's not for the squeamish. I keep mice, I keep doves. Um, people give me roosters. Um, I, I bring kangaroos off the, the road and um, dismember them. So. It's a different type of caring than, than feeding a joey might be, um, which is a bit more cuddly. And, um, and it's not something I enjoy, but yeah, it has to be done. The birds eat meat, and that's um, the price I have to pay for, for having the raptors. The National Park's code of practice for wildlife carers is fairly explicit. They have a flow chart of whether or not they eat the, the animal need, needs to be euthanized or not um, and um, experience my experience tells me a general idea of whether it's going to have some sort of a chance but also we have to uh, by law take them to a vet within 24 hours um, and they will then usually do x-rays raptors particularly need to be x-rayed because you, you um, small differences, particularly in the more dynamic raptors like falcons and, and goshawks, um, they need to be in top condition to be to be released. If you come across an injured bird of prey, the, Na the National Parks Code of Practice says that a, a, an experienced raptor or experienced bird person has to do the capture. But we do get a lot of birds that the members of the public or um, particularly farmers, um, will, will handle themselves and they seem to do it without being injured. The best thing is to call the either wires or us um, and um, I, I will travel for, or we have people around the district, but I will travel for birds of prey. A, a wedge tail can do a lot of damage, for instance, so people have to be really careful. I think landholders are very sympathetic to birds of prey. Most farmers like wedge tails, unlike the old days, when, when there were bounties. The only thing I could think of is to carefully think the use of barbed wire if they can not use it with electric fences uh, as an alternative or plain, barb, uh, plain wire on the top. Um, even sometimes to wrap a wire um, with um, electric tape just so it becomes more visible. Um, because uh, we've had young wedge tails that have been broken up on the wire, um, probably on their first flight, you know. And it's heartbreaking to see a young one just out of the nest. We've got the little eagle here with really good identification on the wings. So landholders who want to monitor the key species over the nesting period will receive this fantastic kit. A couple of copies of the Woodland Birds book. Birds of Prey in Flight identification card. A clipboard where they'll be recording the data. And that data will be collected and sent at the university. Landholders will also get a USB stick which will contain videos, short videos on Birds of Prey identification and it will also give some reference material for those people interested to find out more about the birds.
Everyone involved in the project will receive emails and contacts to potentially join any events or any information about how the project is going. So landholders will receive the Australian Birds of Prey in Flight book, which is a fantastic book. They also will receive a heftier version, Birds of Prey of Australia. This one by Steve Debus, who will sign each of these books for our landholders.